بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعمله اللهم نور قلوبنا بعلمك واستعمل ابدالنا لطاعتك ووفقنا لما تحب وترضى من القول والعمل والنية والهدى إنك على كل شيء قدير آمين يا رب العالمين Respected elders and brothers uh, Dear listeners Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh A very warm welcome to everyone Back to our tafsir sessions And inshallah We hope as we begin a, a new surah of the Quran Surah Al-Taha Inshallah in our new surah for tafsir rather uh, We hope Allah Azza wa allows us to be here From the beginning till the end And attend every single session And allow these sessions to become rejuvenating for all of us, allow it to become a means of finding solutions to our problems, answers to our questions, and a means of us building a very strong relationship with the Qur'an, inshaAllah, tabarak wa ta'ala. This surah, uh, a Meccan surah, 135 verses, um, and inshaAllah will take a few months as we cover this, is known as Surah Taha and Surah, Kal- uh, surah Kaleem as well. Kaleem, as you know, is the laqab, and the, uh, uh, the title given to Musa alayhi salatu salam being Kalimullah, the one who spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the surah that has the most detailed description of Musa alayhi salatu salam's story. The most detailed description most in the, in, uh, anywhere. Of course, Musa alayhi salam's story is mentioned in many places of the Quran. But the surah that has the most detail is Surah Taha. An interesting story is mentioned regarding this surah. Uh, related by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned that 2,000 years before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentions on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, mentioned by Mus- Imam Darimi in his Musnad, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before creating the heavens and the earth, 2,000 years prior to that, he recited Surah Taha and Surah Yasin to the angels. The angels responded by saying, Oh Allah, fortunate and blessed are the people to whom these surahs will be revealed. Fortunate and blessed are those people to whom the surah will be revealed. And blessed are the chest that will memorize them and preserve them. And blessed are the tongues which will recite them. This was the honor distinct to this ummah and this community of Rasulullah that the angels were just envious of. That how special will those people upon whom these beautiful verses will be, rece- will be revealed. And it was this very same surah that became the reason of the conversion to Islam of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, which all of you are aware of. As mentioned in the books of Sirah, that Umar radiallahu anhu was on his way to commit the worst sin possible to take out Rasulullah and to assassinate him. And on the way to assassinate him, Nu'aym ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu stops him and asks him, where are you headed? And he says, I am on my way to assassinate the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At this juncture, um, Nu'aym radiallahu anhu acts swiftly and tells Umar al-Khattab at that time, he says, are you really deceiving yourself? Are you really thinking that this plan is going to work? If you go kill Muhammad ibn Abdullah, do you, think, do you not think his tribe, the Banu Abdul Manaf, will stand up and defend his blood? And that they, do you not think that they will kill you? Do you not think that they will take away, take away your life? And they will never spare you if you kill him. Instead, why don't you focus on certain things that are more relevant to you? How about going looking after your own sister and your brother-in-law who have chosen to leave the religion of your forefathers and have decided to become Muslims? So that statement enraged him and it really made him shift gears from going on his way to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ, he turned gears and he went over to his sister's house. And his sister and brother-in-law both were studying the Qur'an with Khabab radiallahu anhu, Khabab ibn Arat radiallahu anhu. He hears them, some murmuring, and as he comes closer, uh, the, wife, the sister recognizes that my brother is outside nearby, so she hides the pages of the Qur'an that she was reciting. She hid it. She told the teacher uh, that you go hide, go in another room or hide somewhere. Uh, so that my f- brother doesn't see you. So Khabab ibn Arat hides and his sister is there and her brother-in-law is there. And then Umar al-Khattab comes in and says, 
what was it that you, you were reading? And they avoided the question. They, didn't, they tried to avoid it and didn't mention exactly clearly what's happening. Eventually, uh, he uh, challenged them and said, the news is that you have left our religion and you have chosen to become Muslims. And at that time, when she was, it was acknowledged, he began to beat up his brother-in-law. And when his sister came to defend him, he beat her as well leading her to uh, bleed and only after seeing what he had done to his own beloved sister and his brother-in-law that he had become he lost his temper and became so physical with them did he um, decide to you know calm down and figure something out and he said you know what, 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 what exactly were you reading so now when they realize that the news is out and we've already gotten a beating as well what's the point of hiding so then she said to him that, oh, my brother, you know, we are, we are going to become defiant now. We're going to let you know that we have actually left your religion and the religion of our forefathers. And we have chosen to accept the religion of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa And we're not, well, you can do whatever you want. We are not going to leave this faith. So on hearing this, he insisted that he wanted to see what was being recited. The sister said, Fatima said, no, you are impure. And this can only be recited by people who are pure. So she did not want to give him the, the page upon which the verse of the Qur'an recited because she was afraid that he was going to desecrate or tear up this page. And he took an oath and he said, I swear I'm not going to desecrate this, this scripture that you're reading from. I will uh, promise, me, I promise you that you can trust me. But she said, okay, I trust you only on the condition that you go take a bath first, wash up. So he, he washed up. And subhanAllah, he made the effort, right? He made the effort of washing up. He made that effort. He was here to kill someone. And then from there, he shifted to uh, freshening up and doing wudu or freshening up and, and, made, and then asked for the page upon which the Quran was written. So when he began to look at that, Khabab radiallahu anhu, who was in hiding, came out. And he began to exhort Umar al-Khattab to read and accept Islam. And he said that, Umar, your time has come. It was just last night that I was with the Prophet wasallam, and I heard him making dua. I heard him supplicating to Allah. And he was saying, Ya Allah, I want you to assist Islam, bring to the assistance of Islam one of two men, either, uh, either Abu al-Hakam bin Hisham or Umar al-Khattab. Whoever is more beloved to you, bring one of these two powerful noblemen of Quraysh to Islam. Either Abu Jahl or Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. So he says, I heard this dua being made last night. And it seems your time, you have been the chosen one. You, have, you are the chosen one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided to put Islam um, in your heart. So now is the time to come. And do not miss this opportunity. So now within this, how long do you think this took place? Half an hour? Right? That he goes back onto the path towards Rasulullah's direction, but the intention is completely, completely, completely changed. Now, instead of going to assassinate him, he's going to uh, take the shahada and, and proclaim his belief in Rasulullah. And the beautiful story unfolds. So, when the, the, the paper was brought forth and Rasulullah, I mean, Umar al Khattab radiallahu anhu read what was what, the per, portion of the Quran that was written on that, on that, uh, uh, on that uh, uh, piece of paper. It was obviously Surah Taha. Right? He read, he recited these verses, and it was a life changing experience. So, this story is so important here as we begin and embark on the tafsir of Surah Taha that a man who is going to commit the worst possible sin under the sun which is to go kill a prophet. His heart got changed after reciting these verses. So imagine the effect these verses should have on our hearts. As we sit here and listen, all right, to these verses being recited and explained, imagine the effect it should have on it. And Allah forbid if it doesn't, then imagine what's wrong with us. And at the end of the day, it really it's about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turning its attention towards any individual. When Allah's attention is towards an individual, the heart becomes ripe and ready to accept the truth. 
a brother just this Friday messaged me, said in Jum'ah Salah, he was the, 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 the Hafid was reciting, and he said in Jum'ah, whatever Quran was being recited, he began to take uh, effect from the Quran being recited, although he is not an Arabic speaker and doesn't understand the Arabic language. But he said the recitation of the Quran had such a profound effect that I began to tear up and shake in my salah as I was, my whole body was moving as I was affected powerfully by the recitation of the Quran in Jum'ah. And he said, after I finished salam, there was an Arabic speaking brother next to me. He said, he turned to me and just looked at me, just shocked. And he said, brother, do you understand Arabic? And he said, no. So he told him, listen, guess what? I just want to tell you, congratulations, you're blessed. I understand Arabic, but what was recited didn't have an effect on me the way it had an effect on you. You should feel thankful to Allah and honored that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a heart that is able to take effect like that. So you, we see that many times. That we, there are moments in which the heart is just inclined and so soft that whatever Quran is being recited or the name of Allah is being taken, we, we become emotional, we begin to interact with the Quran, we tear up, we start taking effect. And this is the grace of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ If you were to look at the Christians of Najran who came and visit to visit as a delegation, they came to see Rasulullah If you were to see that scene when they began to listen to the Quran being recited, you would see their eyes, literally a'yunahum, that their eyes were welled up with tears. Their eyes are flowing with tears, right? Not just the tears flowing, the eyes are flowing. Meaning that's how much they were crying when these Christians heard the Quran being recited. How is that? That's again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy that He softens the heart sometimes and we begin to take effect. On the flip side of it, when the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not present, then the Quran says, وَإِنَّ مِنَ الْحِجَارَةِ الْمَا يَتَفَجَّرُ مِنْهُ الْأَنْهَارِ وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَشَّقَّقُ فَيَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ الْمَا وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَهْبِطُ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِرَ مَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah Jalla Jalalu says, there are some hearts, ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ Your hearts sometimes become hard. Your hearts become hardened. To what extent do our hearts become hardened? Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَيَيْكَ الْحِجَارَ They become like boulders. Nay, أَوْ أَشَدُّ قَسْوَى More harsh and more hardened than even boulders. Boulders aren't that bad after all, Allah says. Because وَإِنَّمْ الْحِجَارَ There are some boulders that rivers flow from them. There are some boulders that springs come forth from them. Rivers come out from them. And then there are some boulders لا يَحْبِطُ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ That roll down a mountainside out of the fear of Allah. You think it's an avalanche. You think it's, it's gravity. You are thinking it's someone pushed it. In reality, the Quran is saying that stone, Allahu Akbar, got affected by the fear of Allah. Something happened in its world that it took such an effect that it started rolling. It started moving. It became emotional and it rolled from its spot. That even stones have emotions, which we don't comprehend and don't understand. But obviously, from a scientific perspective, what's so hard about that? When we believe there's the continuous movement of atoms that are taking place in every single thing, then how hard is it for us to understand that there is a specific type of life that exists within these type of things, that understand the remembrance of Allah, that take effect from these things, that they seem to be jamadat or, or lifeless things in front of us, but in reality, in front of Allah Azza wa Jalla, they are filled with life. One companion, he says, as the narration mentions that Rasulullah when he would pass in Mecca, there's a hadith mentioned, authentic hadith, that he said, there were, there were, I know those stones in Mecca, that when Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam would walk by, those stones would say salam to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Long before he even came to Medina, the stones had recognized Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. A Bedouin saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi somewhere. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam invited him towards Islam. He said, uh, you know, I'm not going to believe in this unless, unless I see a miracle. What do you want? He says, that tree over there, I want that tree to give be, bear testimony to your, your prophethood. Nabi Sallallahu said, okay, he asked the tree, come. And the, the tree stood up from its spot. It, be, it went through tearing through the soil until it came and stood in front of Rasulullah Sallallahu in this Bedouin. And it proclaimed, I bear witness that none worthy is an unworthy worship but Allah and I bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. And then the Prophet Sallallahu told the tree, go, go back to your spot. The tree went back to its own spot and went back right into the ground. Nabi alayhi salatu salam, Allah Azza wa Jalla gave him these miracles. Of course, they didn't happen 24-7. Otherwise, there would be no test remaining. If every single time you would only see trees and, and um, stones all saying salam to him and all saying the shahada, then why would a person even remain a non-Muslim? The test would end. 
right? If those miracles were to always be happening. But they, didn't ha- they did happen enough, when, you know, for the message to spread. That you have to believe in it. There's, you got to make some effort. You have to believe. Don't expect as Quran says, أَنُلْزِمُكُمُهَا وَأَنْتُمْ لَهَا كَارِهُونَ Do you expect us to push Islam down your throat? Do you expect Iman to be forced down your throat while you don't want it? That's not going to happen. You have to make the first step of saying, I want Islam. I want deen. I'm looking for the truth. I'm looking for the truth. I'm willing to accept the truth. When you make that effort, then you'll see miracles everywhere. But if a person is, subhanAllah, arrogant over his over his accomplishments, then you know what's going to happen. We saw the tweet of a, one of the most famous people in the world and the wealthiest people in the world this, this week. It made the headlines, right? He says, if I die out of some uh, unexpected uh, reasons or whatnot, then he was nice knowing you and someone apparently gave him da'wah on Twitter and said, why don't you accept Islam? And what, how sad the answer would be that if I, if I meant to go and if I die, then you know, I don't mind going to hell. Guess where majority of the people will be? I'll be, I don't mind. I don't mind going to hell. Subhanallah. When pe- that same person who everyone wants to buy money in his stock, everyone wants to co- buy his cars, everyone is envious of having that type of wealth. But what type of faham he's been deprived of? The basic faham of who's Allah. You've got the biggest effort of space exploration. You're spending billions of uh, into looking into space. But we look at the heart is blind. When the heart is blind, you don't need to go into space to recognize Allah. You can just wake up today and say, guess what? I was sleeping and I woke up. What was that about? That was, that was small death. That was a sister of death. I was so knocked out, I have no idea. Now I come back to life and look at how I'm able to function. Where, did this, where was my soul last night? How did my soul come back to me? That's sufficient for me to say, Alhamdulillah, All praise belongs to Allah who's given me life after death and to Him is the ultimate return. Sufficient. You can go to sleep and wake up as a Muslim. You can look at your hands and think about the, the digestive method, how Allah has made the whole food process how food comes into your fingers, you touch it and how all of the enzymes get released, food starts getting br- br- breaking down before you even get into your mouth, how you're able to feel the texture, the heat, uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, various forms of, 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 of types of food you're eating, just by feeling it before you even look at it, before you even taste it, before you even smell it, the interaction that happens and the, the enjoyment you get, the enjoyment you get just by touching your burger or enjoyment you get by touching your fruit or whatever the case may be. It's sufficient to accept Islam just by looking at those things. Looking at your reproductive system, looking at your digestive system, looking at your eyes, looking at your ears. SubhanAllah, any one of these is sufficient for a person to accept Islam. You don't need to go into space. But now you have been blessed to get with a brain and a mind to come up with a whole huge effort of sending man, man to space. Not one or two, but thousands. And you want to develop, you want to develop cities in space. And yet... If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a person blind, he won't see Allah there. It's crazy how, how scary it is. That's why it goes back to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu's mercy upon us. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks upon us with the light of nu- when Allah places his nur upon us, his faith upon us, his rahma upon us, everything will fall into place. Everything will start making sense to us. And if that doesn't happen, then the most obvious signs of Allah's greatness, we will become blind. What's that? Allah says, Sur Yusuf, the last verses. How many there are signs? How many signs are there? How many signs there are in the heavens and the earth that you pass right by them while not looking at them? Allah is asking. Majority of the people will not believe in the signs of Allah. Majority of the people will not believe in Allah. Majority will not believe. Majority will not believe. Although the signs are blaring, saying, come, 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 look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we've been taught time and again that do not go with the flow. Don't look at what everyone else is doing. Everyone else is doing. Well, everyone, the Quran is saying majority are not believing in Allah. So we don't focus on what majority is doing. Instead, we have to focus on what the minority, it might be minority. SubhanAllah, there's a ulama have written that Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The people of Sunnah and Jama'ah, the people who follow the, the, the deen that Rasulullah left behind and who follow the Sahaba, what Nabi Ali said, hold on to the Jama'ah, hold on to the group. The ulama have written that Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah doesn't have to be a large group of people. Guess what? It doesn't even have to be a group of people. They said there could be places and time in this world where Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah is one person. 
Because the truth doesn't follow anyone. You have to follow the truth. The fruit doesn't, the truth doesn't follow anyone. You have to follow the truth. So if there's one person in the Ahlul Sunnah Jama'ah, then so be it. Isn't that an amazing point? That no matter how few they are, don't look at the numbers. Look at what is being done. If it's correct, that's what's most important. So these verses of Surah Taha were the, the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this became the means of the hidayah of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And we pray and we beg to Allah that these become the means of our hidayah as well. Say ameen. Alright? Brothers, don't leave these gaps in between. Can you all please make a little bit of effort to move forward? And inshallah, when you sit together, you yourself will, will feel the barakat. Please sit as close as possible, inshallah. May Allah reward you. May Allah bless you. Make every step that you're taking forward here a step towards your paradise. Say ameen. May He make this a step towards opening up the doors of, of, of the secrets of the Qur'an. Ameen, Rabbil Alameen. So you have this, Allah Azza wa reciting Surah Taha and Surah Yaseen thousands of years before the world, before the creation. And, and, and inshallah, we hopefully Allah will bless us to be able to hear these verses from Allah in the Akhirah as well, inshallah. So he verse, uh, uh, let's recite here now, inshallah. In the verses, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ طه ما أنزلنا عليك القرآن لتشقى إلا تذكرة لمن يخشى تنزيلا ممن خلق الأرض والسماوات العلا الرحمن على العرش استوى له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وما بينهما وما تحت الثرى وإن تجهر بالقول فإنه يعلم السر وأخفى الله لا إله إلا هو له الأسماء الحسنى verses one through eight طه ما أنزلنا عليك القرآن we have not sent the Quran down upon you لتشقى to make your life miserable to distress you to make you face hardship O رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم we that was not the purpose of sending the Quran upon you إلا تذكرة لما يخشى but rather this Qur'an was revealed as a reminder. Tafkira as a reminder for everyone. But who will benefit? Those who revere Allah. Those who fear Allah. Those who are in awe with the Qur'an. They will be the ones who benefit. It's meant for everyone. But unfortunately, not everyone is ready to benefit from it. You have to be awestruck by Allah and by His Qur'an to benefit from it. Tanzilan. Where did this come from? It was, it has been, it was, it, des, it was descended, uh, descending from Mimman Khalaqal, from the one who created the earth and the high heavens. Ar-Rahman, the all-merciful, who has settled himself over the throne befittingly, right? Not in any manner that you think, but in a manner that befits Allah. We don't apply it to the way humans, um, you know, uh, ascend a throne, etc. Lahu ma fi samawat, who is this Allah? To him belongs all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth and all that is between them and all that is beneath the soil. And whenever you utter words out loud and for that matter, silently, he indeed knows the secret. Sir means a secret. And what is yet more hidden. Allah, there is no God but him. To him belong the most excellent names. So Taha, what is Taha? <coughs> this is obviously what we call the broken letters. Huruful muqatta'at. Right, the broken letters. The, the real answer, the first answer is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows its meaning best. No one knows. Allah knows best what Taha means. He left it, we leave it like that. That's why it's translated as Ta-ha. Right? So, uh, so, so this, is how, this is how it's mentioned over here. Now, the ulama have um, definitely given some possible explanations beyond this first answer that I gave, which is Allah knows his best. Uh, what, for those who are, who are listening to this discussion first time, very briefly, the purp- one of the purposes of broken letters is is for people to recognize and realize that no one can bring anything similar to the Qur'an even if they try to do so. This is what we call i'jaz al-Qur'an. The fact that the Qur'an, it cannot be imitated. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking you to bring. Okay, if you, if you know Taha, if you, if, if, you, if you think you can copy the Qur'an and make a similar 
uh, example of the Quran, then what are you going to say about Taha? Let's bring something else. You can't bring something else. You have no, we, the Arabs were shocked. They were masters of the Arabic language. But when it came to these types, they were not accustomed to seeing broken letters like this in the language. So they came and they had to stop over there. That's one meaning. Second meaning, um, Sa'id ibn Jubair, rahmatullahi alayhi, this tabi'i, he says, Taha isman li rasulillah. He says, Taha are two names of the Prophet ﷺ. The first Ta refers to a Tahir, a Tahir min al dhunub the one who is pure from all sins. And Ha refers to al Hadi, right? The one who is a guide, right? So he is pure from sins and he is um, the guide towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Taha is like, Ya Taha, O Rasulullah ﷺ. We did not reveal the Quran upon you. So it would make sense that Taha is a name of Rasulullah Sallam. Allah is addressing him and saying, Oh Rasulullah, this is your, your uh, honorific t- title. Oh Taha, meaning oh the one who is pure from sins. And Ha, oh the guide towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have not revealed the Quran upon you to cause you discomfort. That's one explanation. Another explanation is Taha is speaking about Tarabul mu'minin fil jannah. Ta for tarab. Tarab means excitement, happiness, enjoyment. And ha is from hawan. Hawan means disgrace. So ta is referring to tarabul mu'minin fil jannah, the excitement of the believers in paradise. And ha is referring to hawan wa ahlil nari fil nar. It is the, dis- the despicable, horrible dis- disgrace of the disbelievers in hellfire. And there are many other possible explanations of that. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ No one knows the interpretation truly except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says after that, مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنِ We have not revealed the Qur'an upon you. We sent down upon you to distress you. Right? So this is an important point over here. That whatever, before I move on to this ayah, whatever, whatever names, you know, you know they say, uh, you, your father was like this, your mother was like this. So what do they want? They expect us to follow in the footsteps of our parents and the good things that they have. So Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam is our spiritual father. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasalam is our spiritual father. So the attributes and the qualities he had is something we, you, you and I all should aspire to have. So it's a moment for us to reflect that to what degree have I become tahir bin al purified from sins. Ramadan has just ended. It's just been a week. What degree have I kept myself clean after Ramadan? Right? SubhanAllah. Have I opened up my book of sins already real quick and started filling it up? Or have I done a good enough effort, alhamdulillah, at least a good effort, attempted effort of keeping myself pure from sins? And ha, hadi, what effort am I doing to become a means of guiding people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? So... These two names of Rasulullah Sallallahu we should reflect and see, do I have these within, within my own self? Allah Jalla Jalalu says, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ Whoever does an iota of good deed will see its reward. Whoever does an iota of sin will see, its, will see its punishment as well. So we should focus on our own selves in our book of deeds to see where you and I stand when it comes to this aspect of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's qualities. When you look at Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and Allah says, I don't want you to suffer from the Qur'an. What does that mean? Because many people may understand different things. Say, I don't want you to suffer means, you know, Quran, I don't need to, we don't need to practice too much on the Qur'an. We don't need to recite too much of the Qur'an. You know, we don't need to make our taraweeh uh, qiyamul layl too long. We don't need to uh, recite long because the Qur'an has not been revealed. Okay. That if someone, if someone were to really destroy their life by that and he killed themselves, then we could say, yes, you know, the Qur'an definitely has not been revealed to, 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 for a person to make his life unbearable. But unfortunately, that's not the case. We are simply struggling to stay connected with the Qur'an. We recited one juz, one and a half juz, two juz, three juz in Ramadan. Some of us recited a quarter or more or less. Ask ourselves in this past eight days how much Qur'an was recited. Each one of us ask himself, right? Ask yourself, what did you recite from last Monday till now? When the, the week prior, the last week of Ramadan, we went all out. We went all out. Everyone's trying to finish their khatam, read, 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 read. And to, uh, as though tarawi, 20 rakats wasn't enough, we wanted to do Qiyamul Layl as well. People, how many people came in at 2 a.m.? Brother, where's the Qiyamul Layl? Right? Where's the Qiyamul Layl? We want to do Qiyamul Layl. Alhamdulillah, amazing. But what happened after that? So we need, there needs to be some level of moderation. 
That whatever good we took in Ramadan, mashallah, great, excited phase, do it. I'm not saying don't do it. But we have to keep up with a portion of that after Ramadan as well. So what does it mean then, what was Allah conveying to Rasulullah Wasallam? Two explanations have been given. One is, Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, um, he had, uh, you know, he, he stood up to, for such a long portion of the night, reciting the Quran. Allah says, إِنَّ رَبَّكَ يَعْلَمْ Indeed your Lord knows أَنَّكَ تَقُومُ أَدْنَى مِنْ ثُلُوثَيِ اللَّيْلِ وَنِصْفَهُ وَثُلُوثَهُ وَطَائِفَةُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ مَعَكْ Allah knows you are standing up half of the night, two-thirds of the night, more than a third of the night. Majority of the night you're standing. And a group of believers with you are standing in Qiyamul Layl every single night. Allah knows that. And you know Aisha radiallahu anha would look at her husband making such a long Qiyam and she would say to him that why are you standing? Look at your feet. Your sweet feet have swollen. Oh, you know, a wife who loves her husband. Why are you standing up to this degree that your feet have swollen? And he would respond. And, he would, and she would then say a proof. There's no reason for you to ex exert yourself to this level. When Allah has already announced that you are masoom and protected from sin. And any past or future mistakes that may come about, all have been forgiven then why are you exerting yourself to this degree? And the response he would give is, أَفَلَا أَكُونَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Shall I not at least then be a grateful servant to Allah? That I need to be grateful. If he's just because he's forgiven me, doesn't mean, chutti, finish, go off, go on, you know, do whatever I want. I have to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one explanation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeing how much Rasulullah is spending in the night reciting Quran and the non-Muslims are making fun of him now. They say, look at you, you've become so tired, you've become so fatigued, you've become so weak that you are reciting Quran all day, all night, and you are depriving of yourself of your sleep, and inna li badanika alayka haqqa, your body has a right above, uh, upon you, you need to take care of your body, you need to take care of your family, etc., etc. That's one explanation of this. And then the second explanation of ma'anzal alayka al-Quran al tashqa is that Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam had the most merciful heart that anyone can ever imagine. And he had a merciful heart. And then Allah unveiled for him things of the hereafter that you and I are unaware of. So this compounded upon one another, causing him to be filled and overwhelmed with concern for his ummah. And when he would see that what's wrong with these people? They're not believing in the message of the Qur'an. They are not making tawbah. They are not repenting. Then this, over, this would cause him immense distress. And he would begin to uh, uh, lose sleep, literally, and much, much, much more than that. We covered this concept in, the, in one of the initial, maybe second dars of Surah Al-Kahf, if you remember, extensively. Because that's where one of the verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاقِعٌ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ أَثَارِهِمْ إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَ Ayah number six. It is very possible that you will end up killing yourself. You're right, you will end up killing. Baqa'a nafsak means, I remember, if you remember, it means to, to slaughter the animal or to, to take the knife to the, to, the neck, to the neck, all the way till the spinal cord, until the, you actually cut off the spinal cord as well. That's how deep it's, that's how deep the cut is, subhanAllah. So that's the verse, <coughs> that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Rasulullah that you may end up harming yourself to this degree, over what? If these people will not believe in the Quran, asafan, out of sadness, out of grief, and out of sadness, you will end up killing yourself. So, this is the concept being mentioned over here as well that I don't want you to be so grief struck by the condition of the ummah that they're not accepting Islam and they're not taking heed that you end up overwhelming and overburdening yourself. Surah Al-Kahf is one ayah. Allah says in Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number two, فَلَا يَكُنْ فِي صَدْرِكَ حَرَجٌ مِّنْ Let your chest not become constricted and suffer due to what you're seeing about your people. Surah Al-Nahl, ayah 127, وَلَا تَحْزَنْ عَلَيْهِمْ Do not grieve over them. Surah Fatir, ayah number eight, فَلَا تَذْهَبْ نَفْسُكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسَرَاتِ Do not allow, you allow yourself to be lost and killed over the the disobedience of the disbelievers, hasaratin, out of sadness and grief over them. All of these verses and more 
are connected with this concept here. That Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam was felt the burden of the ummah not following the deen. Let's, let's look at some of the hadith. What, what, what concerned Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam. It's mentioned in, in, in tafkir of Imam Qurtubi. He says, مَا مِنْ بَيْتٍ إِلَّا وَمَلَكُ الْمَوْتِ يَقِفُ فِيهِ فِي الْيَوْمِ خَمْسَ مَرَّاتِ There isn't a single day in a single home except the angel of death stands at that home, all of our homes, including today, five times a day. فَإِذَا رَأَى أَنَّ الْعَبْدَ قَدْ إِنْقَضَ أَجَلُهُ Meaning he is looking at each home five times a day to make sure, do I've got some, some appointments here today? Do I have appointments here? Every single day, five times a day, visiting each home to see what appointments are there, who's got to go. He says, when he sees now that a, ta- a time has arrived for a servant for his, for his uh, time to leave this dunya, and his risk has come to an end, that's when you know it's time to go. When the Ramadan al says, okay, it's now zero. How many times can you breathe? If you got written there. For all of us, it's written there. We have 1 million breaths left, 100,000 left, 50,000 left. How many times you're going to inhale and exhale? Everything is to the, to the dot. Like you have a digital clock to the seconds. Similar to that, to the seconds, to the number, to the single digit, how many times are we going to breathe and inhale and exhale? It's all being it's written there. How many grains of rice? How many grains of vegetables? How many gulps of water? Every single thing written down. When Malak al maut comes and he sees, risk is at zero now or, or in single digits, and he knows it's going to come, alqa alayhi gham al maut. He starts putting upon him the condition that comes prior to death, which is like the pangs of death begin. فَغَشِيَتُهُ سَكَرَاتُهُ The pangs of death then begin to overwhelm this person. فَمِنْ أَهْلُ الْبَيْتِ الضَّارِبَةُ وَجْهُهَا There are some family members, who will, some women, or men, but women we're speaking about here in specifically, that will begin to slap their faces. And nashiratu sha'araha, who will start pulling their hair. Asariqatu biwailiha, who will be screaming out for destruction to come upon them. Meaning, she's losing her husband, she's losing her son, she's losing her father, and she's losing herself. Fayaqulu malak al maut. Then the angel of death speaks and says, Mimmal faza. Mimmal faza. What are you what are you screaming about? Wa female jaza. What are you wailing about? For what? ما أذهبت ما أذهبت لواحد منكم رزقا. I have not cut short any of your sustenance. ولا قربت له أجلا. I have not brought his death prior to its time. وإن لي فيكم لعودة. And indeed, he's going today, but I'm not going. I'm going to come back to this house again and again and again. حتى لا أبقي منكم أحدا. Until I will ensure that there's not a single one amongst you living. فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِي The Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, I swear by that being in whose hand is the life of Muhammad. لَوْ يَرَوْنَ مَكَانَهُ وَيَسْمَعُونَ كَلَامَهُ If the people of the home were to see the angel of death saying this, were to look at the, look at the, feature, look at the face of the angel of death as he stands and says, says this, لَذَهَلُوا عَنْ مَيِّتِهِمْ They would completely forget the dead man or the dying man. وَلَبَكَوْا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ And they would begin to cry upon themselves. This happens how many times a day? Every single day, five times a day. Malik al-Maut comes and speaks. Now this thing is you and I don't hear about this. Nabi Alayhi is aware of this. He's seeing that. And he's shocked that we don't take effect. He's, he's sad, but he cannot. Once Rasulullah was walking by a grave, and he said, I could ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you to hear what's happening. How many times on the highway, in the expressway, we drive by graveyards? How many times in our, in our journey to a school, journey to office, journey to a grocery store, every day we're passing by graveyards? And if anything, we look and say, wow, nice flowers, nice landscaping. That's what goes through our mind. We don't even think of what's happening there. And Rasulullah is saying, <coughs> if I could, I would have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you to hear what's happening inside the grave as we are passing by right now. And if he were to accept my dua, and if he were to hear it, then what would happen? You would hear such screaming and wailing that he is hearing now, that you would stop burying your dead. You would let them rot outside, but you would not put them into the grave because you heard what happens down there. And you would be afraid that that will happen to your own dead. Obviously, barzakh, death, you don't have to be buried in the grave for that stuff to begin, by the way. Right? That begins as soon as death overtakes a person. But naturally, we have our natural instincts as well. If you hear a screaming and wailing coming from the grave, how would we put our, our beloved family member down there? 
Subhanallah. Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam heard this. Nabi alayhi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There was there was instances where animals would go berserk and crazy with the companions near a graveyard. They would come and say, "Ya Rasulullah, last night my camel went crazy. Last night my horse went crazy. Last night something else happened." So where were you going? We were passing by a grave. Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam would say, "Well, guess what? The reason was that you passed by a grave in which the punishment was taking place. Your animal heard it, and that's what made him react in that manner." Allah subhanahu wa taala has allowed the entire creation to hear what's happening in the grave, except for us and jinn thaqalain us and the jinn because why we're the ones who are mukallaf we're the ones who are being tested to believe in Allah the rest of them there's no test for them in that sense they already believe in Allah they see it they see it the cats and the dogs and the animals they already see that we don't see any of this stuff and that's why the test is for us right so nabi alayhi salatu wasalam is seeing this every day around him imagine what he feels abu abu uh, abu uh, darda radiyallahu anhu he says fa walladhi nafsi uh, he says I swear if you were to know what you will suffer after death. <coughs> if you were to know what will, you, what will happen to you after death. Amazing. He said you would never eat a morsel of food out of desire. You would never eat a morsel of food out of desire. You would never drink a gulp of any water. Or a juice or anything out of shahwa. You would never enter your home trying to take any shelter or shade. But rather you would run out to the jungles and to the open fields crying upon your own lot. And then you'd say, I swear by Allah, I wish I was simply a plant or a tree that was plucked off of the ground and eaten, eaten by an animal. Meaning, if a person were to know what really awaits us, then you would not eat unnecessarily. You would not even be able to have one morsel for, this, for the sake of it. You would only eat just enough to live and only drink just enough to be alive. And the rest of the time, you and I would be focused on preparing for the day when is definitely coming, when you and I have to leave this world. But we see the ghafla, we see the heedlessness, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is looking at all of this, and it hurts him. It hurts him to see what's going on. When Khadija radiallahu anha, when she told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to, to rest, this happened right after the revelation began. Initial revelations began. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Khadija radiallahu anha, he said, wrap up my bedding. Or that the time of sleep has gone to an end. Now there is no rest. Now there is no sleep. Now it's only work until death comes up to us. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until death comes upon you. Allah Jalla Jalalhu wanted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to not exert himself to this level. That's why he says, وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمَعِمْ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ O oh, Muhammad Sallallahu you cannot make the people in the grave hear you. These people who you have been giving da'wah to for years, they're like dead people in the grave. How many times are you going to go to them? How many times are you going to speak to them? How many times are you going to talk to them? They simply are not listening to you. So do not be overwhelmed by the fact that they don't listen to you. Instead, make effort somewhere else. And Nabi Ali Sallallahu Alaihi is reported to have said, "Man manahal hikmata ghayra ahliha faqad dalamaha." Whoever gives wisdom to people who don't deserve it has oppressed wisdom. Whoever gives wisdom to people who don't deserve it, whoever who gives knowledge to people who don't deserve it, has what? Has oppressed knowledge, has oppressed wisdom. Woman manaha ahliha faqad dalamahum. And whoever keeps knowledge and wisdom away from the people who are most worthy of it has oppressed the people. So this is one of the <coughs> amazing things that a teacher is supposed to look at. That who am I giving this knowledge to? This is actually an interesting thing that ulama have spoken about. And, and much has been written about this. That wadiul ilmi inda ghayri ahliha. Ghayri ahli ka muqallid al-khanazir al That the one who gives knowledge to people who don't deserve it or who those who cannot appreciate it is like the one who takes a... A, 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 a necklace of gems and puts it around a pig. Meaning that's not the place for it. The necklace is great, but that's not the place where it should be hung. Similarly, the one who gives knowledge or wisdom to people who don't expect, who don't deserve it, or who don't appreciate it, who don't understand it, <coughs> is doing injustice to knowledge. 
So Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam is worried about what, where is he, where is the best effort he could be making and where, what should he be doing with, with the Qur'an that has been given to him. Now let's stop for a moment and see how much concern do you and I have when it comes to the ummah? Right? When we see people not accepting the message of the Qur'an within our own home, within our own communities, what role, what effect does it have in our heart when someone says no? Right? This is something I want us to think about. You ask people, did you, did you come to the tafsir Qur'an? Yes, I did. Did you bring anyone with you? I did. I messaged 10 people. No, everyone was busy. No one responded. Okay, now that same person, we tell him, something simple. He said, man, last night I wanted to go out to eat, but I don't know who wants to go out to eat alone. It's not nice to go eat alone or sitting there alone in a burger joint eating yourself. It's kind of, you know, not so nice. I messaged 10 of my friends. None of them were available. He, he's not dying hungry. He's got his whole fridge is filled with stuff, but he doesn't want to eat what his mom cooked. So he wants to go out to eat. Right? SubhanAllah, he couldn't find a friend to go out to eat. He's going to cry about the fact that he didn't have yet to go alone to go eat. He had to go through drive through instead of sit dine in. He's crying at the fact that he couldn't find friends to hang out with. But SubhanAllah, you don't feel pain that you invited 10 people to the masjid and everyone was busy? That's the point. Like literally, when people say no to the deen, there's absolutely no pain. They could say no to a, a burger, you'll feel the pain. No to something much, 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 much insignificant than that, and you'll feel disappointed. You'll feel disappointed. But there's no sense of disappointment. If there's no disappointment, why will you think of something else? Look at the conversation, the text message between you and your friends when you, go out, when you want to do something together. He says, I'm busy. Come on, man, let's go. Right? Why can't we do this? Back and forth, back and forth. Your project is due tomorrow, not today. You can, you can, you can adjust your schedule. I'll take care of this. I'll drop you off at your home. Tell your mom this. Tell your dad this. I'll do this, do that. Look at the conversations that go between you and your friends when you want to do something. It's not like simple, no, okay, salam alaikum. We keep on going because it means something to you. Whatever you're trying to do together, you, it, it means a lot to you. And because it's entertaining. Entertainment it has this degree of importance in our life. But with that same person, you say, let's go for Isha together. Let's go for Maghrib together. He says, no, end of conversation. Choro, I've done my job. That's not an ummati's job. That is not how ummati of Rasulullah works. We have to come up with new innovative ways and think about different methods and different ways. Dean is marketing. People come and say, you would be a great in sales if you're in sales. I said, I am already in sales. Who said I'm not in sales? Right? We're all in sales. We're all selling the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the people. Right? We are all agents of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selling jannah. We're out there. The, look at that person who tried to sell credit cards at the airport. He gets trying to get you to sign up. SubhanAllah, he, feels, he gets rejection 99.9% .9 of the time. Lekin, he doesn't cry, doesn't pout, still smiling, keeps on going, keeps on going, keeps on going, because that's what he knows his livelihood is on. Doesn't care what happens. He's focused and he starts thinking, what is a different way I can start up a conversation with the people passing by in front of me to get them to stop at my booth and sign up to a credit card. This is the basic level of marketing. Well, when we, when, why when it comes in the matters of deen, not only are we the worst marketers, we actually turn people away from the deen. Someone wants to come after meeting us, he says, no, I don't want to go to the masjid. Forget this man. He's on his way to the masjid, or he meets us in the, in the prayer hall, he meets us in the lobby, we do something, we say something, we act in a certain manner, he turns back and he says, that's it. And I've heard this myself with my own ears, of people complaining that a certain person did X, Y, Z in the masjid, and he says, since then I've been turned off from the masjid. My children have been turned off from the masjid, etc., etc. And those people are like, you know, blind with blinders on. They have no idea, like an 18-wheeler truck plowing through. They don't care what type of collateral damage they're causing. Just going. Now, I'm going to my masjid, and in the process of that, how many people's hearts I break, how many people I make upset, how many people I make angry, it's not my problem. My focus, I got to get to the front row. <laughs> right? I got to get to the front row. Besides that, I don't care. Yeah, there's a group of people like that. Subhanallah, so focused on getting to the front row, and they don't care about any collateral damage they make on the way. So now this is, this is something we need to ensure that we don't become. And instead, if as ummatis of Rasulullah we cannot be a true ummati if we, there's no pain. So first of all, what's the first thing? Start inviting people towards the masjid. Start inviting people towards the deen. Start inviting people towards any level of deen above where they are at today. You might, if someone says, they don't pray. <clears throat> Invite them to eat salah. Invite them to eat. Something is better than nothing. You have no idea what's going to happen. The guy never prays. Tell him, hey, why don't you just come for the, listen to the Jummah. How many times we invite non-Muslims to listen to the Jummah khutbah? Yeah? 
You, how many times say, I want to invite a non-Muslim to attend the sermon? Brother, he's not even a Muslim. He, he doesn't have to pray yet until he doesn't accept Islam. He, the masjid is open for him to sit in the back and listen to the sermon, the khutbah. Why can't a Muslim who doesn't pray at work, one of your office colleagues, one of your co co-workers, one of your uh, uh, classmates at college, why can't we say, why don't you just come and listen to the sermon? The khutbah. That's it. You don't want to pray? Don't pray. You don't want to do wudu. You don't want to just sit in the back and listen. <clears throat> The idea is invite people to one step higher than where they are. Islam is thousands of steps long. Thousands of, Jannah is thousands of steps. If he's on step number 200, invite him to 201. You don't have to take him to invite him to step 1000. Whatever degree he is it, take him one step closer. And that's the mashallah, look at the step you all did when I asked you to come closer. That's one step, that's many steps you took. You have no idea, that's a huge. Those are not small steps. It's one step for man, right? SubhanAllah. This is actually many steps towards Akhirah. Our elders, they give so many amazing pieces of advice. They say when you go to someone's house in Jawla and visit him, to, inviting him towards the masjid, they say when you go to someone's house or you go to someone's office, just <clears throat> tell the person if you're speaking to him, by Torasap Yahajai. One step from his doorstep onto the, uh, what you call, uh, front, uh, to, the, to the ground floor or to the uh, you know, driveway. Make him take one step and say, why? Why don't I go inside? Don't go inside, you don't want to burden the person, you don't want him to have to bring you know, ikram, water, drinks, this, that, that. We just want to connect him to the masjid. But the idea by making him, how about I just talk to him just like that? SubhanAllah, the wisdom is amazing. They say if you can just make him take one step, you never know, that one step that he took will be recorded in the books of Allah as a step towards the masjid. He may not have ever gotten into the car and come. But the fact that you were able to get him to take one step towards you, it's not towards you, it's towards Allah. And Allah is looking at that. And based on the one step that he took towards Allah, Allah will run towards him. SubhanAllah. Right? This is a way to get a person worthy of the mercy of Allah. Make him take a step. That's the way we have to think. Another beautiful piece of advice when we're in Pakistan, they would tell, with, uh, tell us that you know you go into the bazaar, marketplace, you're giving da'wah to people. <clears throat> Sometimes you're, giving, you're standing at a store and say, Bhai Ajal, come, come together. You got 10, 15 people around you. And they would say that Bhai, when you're giving da'wah, in the process of giving da'wah, just in a nice way, say Bhai Allah, Allah Barahe, Allah is great, Allah's kalima is great. A person recites La ilaha illallah once, these are his rewards. The person who dies after reciting kalima La ilaha illallah, the one whose last words are La ilaha illallah, he will enter paradise. Let's all together say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And you'd say, make everyone say it together. Why is that? One is that inshallah their sins will be forgiven. Number two, if someone had accidentally uttered something that take him out of the fold of Islam, which many, unfortunately, many, many, many times people do. They make fun of the sunnah. They make fun of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi They make fun of the symbols of Islam without realizing it, they've actually left their Islam. Islam. But they're realizing it. Now, how, who knows what? But at least by saying the kalima out loud and making everyone say it, alhamdulillah, we have now, at the very least, made people, inshallah, get their sins forgiven. And if someone, Allah forbid, their iman needed to be renewed, it got renewed. Isn't that amazing? The wisdom by which we give da'wah. So my, 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 my um, goal here for all of us to think is that you don't need to take a, you don't need to be a graduate of anything to be a da'i. You need to be an ummati of Rasulullah Sallam, a follower of Rasulullah Sallam, to feel the love and the concern for the ummah that he had. Otherwise, stop saying your ummati and say, Risalat Zindabad and this Zindabad. Please, that, this is, is fake. If the, the, the actual love for Rasulullah Sallam, the actual love for Rasulullah Sallam means you care about the ummah the way he cared for the ummah. Right? And so if you care about it, <clears throat> then you will come up with ways of how to fix the ummah. Instead of saying, log nahi You know, when I travel many times, and even here as well, people have gotten so accustomed to being pessimistic. Right? Asal baat kya hai? It's just copping out. That's what it is. You know what I mean? Karna nahi kaam. Kaam nahi karna hai. We don't want to do the work. Yeah, brother, I made the announcement, no one showed up for the program. When we travel, we do programs. This is what our community imams, boards, and masajid boards, etc. They'll say, nahi, koi nahi aata yaar, hamare yaar. Koi nahi aata hai. Many times, you know, when, uh, when I'm received at the airport and, uh, and I say, okay, what's the plan? I'm here for 12 hours. What are you going to do? I'm here for 24 hours. What are you going to do? Please, you know, I don't want to dampen your spirits, but let me just dampen it for you. Not dampen it. Let me just pour a five bucket gallon water right now on it. Right? And then let, let me put five buckets of, of, of oil and light it and fire to your ambitions. This place is dead. We're ground zero. Huh? Nothing is going to happen over here. Okay? Sorry. I don't know who gave us your, gave you, uh, us, uh, you, you our city name and address, but this is nothing going to happen here. 
This is, mashallah, the, the way I'm received many times at the airport. With the, and the conversation to the masjid. Our community is bekar, useless, no one comes. Yes, Juma, the people will be there, but there's no motivation, no change. We're like this, like that. And we realize, I said, I'm sure your community is like that. And you're a great representation, representation of that. Aap jaisi fikr ho to aisi hoga na. If this is the type of mentality, this is the type of pessimism, this is the type of, you know, subhanAllah, stagnation, what do you expect? This is not the way work gets done. This type of negativity and pessimism. You have to <clears throat> think of different ways. If, agar aapki dukaan thi, if you had your store, is that what you would do? Would you really run a business like this? You don't have a single customer the entire day. First day, second day, third day. The entire week, not a single customer. Would you be in business? I say, yaar, log bade kharaab hai. Nahi humse. They don't, they're very bad. They just don't buy from me. Would you do that? You would think of different ways of marketing and if you literally, what you're selling is not going to sell there, you would sh close up your shop and open up something different. And if that doesn't work, then you'd go find, you'd go to another location. The fact that you're sitting here means you're not making, a, you and I are not making the proper effort. The himmat, we all have to do himma. This is something I've been mentioning so much in Ramadan too, in, the last, in our durus, in the last 10 days, is that if we want to take the community post-Ramadan to the next level, which means your own family, your own neighborhood, it, it starts off with ourselves becoming supercharged. To say, one thing I'm never going to leave is one program a, a, a week, the tafsir or the, the hadith, that's whatever the case is. I'm not going to leave this. Kuch bhi ho jai. Anything happens to the extent, if Allah forbid, my car breaks down, I'm going to get an Uber and come. That's what's going to happen. I'm going to take an Uber and come. My, you know, that's it. Because at no way I'm going to miss the dars. When you have that level of dedication, then you see Allah will take work from you. Otherwise, for every smallest excuse, you know, You'll say the air freshener, dispenser, stop working at my home, I can't come. Right? What? But that's the type of, this is exactly such useless type of things. People come up, find an ex, any excuse not to come. So now if we are not ourselves motivated, we're not going to be able to motivate other people. So don't take a no as a no is what I'm trying to say. I'll ask those people who are trying to get married. Uh, they, they don't take a no as a no. They come up with different ways. No, please, 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 please. Right? They come, they come up with different 10 ways of trying to prove that they are the best groom out there. Right? The most eligible bachelor. All that, they try to prove it. So we have to come up with various methods and ways to get people connected to the house of Allah. Stop blaming the people. Blame ourselves for not making an effort. And we who attend the masjid, we are to blame. Because we have the faham, we have, a, we have some understanding. Why are we not making an effort that is, uh, that is uh, uh, you know. And I, I want to I, 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 I tell you one thing. Allah's help will come based on the level of ambition that you have. Real story, last year ki baatim, before the retreat, I went on this quick blitz trip, you know, multiple cities, multiple states per weekend. And all, every single time, relax brother, nothing's gonna happen over here. You know, many people before you came and tried, nothing happens. I'm like, no, I'm sorry, I, I didn't, this is not me. You tried that with other people, inshallah, with the help of Allah. I made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm here for 24 hours. Ya Allah, take the work of 24 years from me within 24 hours. And that's gonna happen. And you're gonna be part of that. Okay, I said, just watch. And subhanAllah, I'm telling you, from within, within, within 12 hours, 8 hours to so 12 hours that we're in these cities, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought from each one of the cities, 60 people purchased their tickets and flew in. Hotels and tickets came to our retreat there, the, the annual retreat, within 12 hours. I mean, we had about 500 people from out of state that attended. And from each state, within 12 hours, 60 days, 60, 50, 70 people came. And these people are sitting there watching. What are you going to? I'm not... I'm not playing doing any magic, nothing. It's just being optimistic and working hard and not taking a no for a no, you know? But to say no, you have to come up with answers to people's excuses. You have to come up with answers to people. If you're not willing to make this effort, my beloved brothers and sisters, then we are not true du'at. We're not true representatives of Rasulullah We really are not. Being an ummati of Rasulullah means you, ca you cannot just take a no as a no. You keep on going with different ways, different tactics, and coming up. Because this apathy is what I want this group of people sitting in front of me to stop having. When, you, when I ask, or you ask me, or I ask the students, what would you do? Oh, I texted, no one showed up. Yikai, what kind of answer is that? What is that, man? That, would you ever do that for anything else? No. Why is it for the deen? We are so apathetic. That we simply say, I texted 10 people. That doesn't do anything to you. If you want to start a business, you're looking for seed money, you want investors, you want donations, or you want a loan, you don't do stuff like that. You go and go out of your way and exert yourself. We must exert ourselves for the deen. Otherwise, we're fooling ourselves thinking that making a bayan on a mic is a program. 
uh, by announcing there's a program, is a program. That, that's not how the effort went. Otherwise, Rasulullah would not have to go door to door, and would not have to suffer and have to take upon himself the spit, the saliva, the stones, the intestines of animals, and the blood and the guts of animals being thrown at him. Why did that happen? He would just sit there and say, Thus after Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Shah, come to Masjid Nabawi, this is where it's happening. This is, the Masjid Nabawi is going to be lit. All of you come. Just come. No one, that's not how it happened. Makabatullah is lit, just come. N none of that. You saw how it was. Nabi Sallallahu himself had to travel every single day and make the effort. So we have a huge, uh, huge opportunity in America right now. The hearts are soft. The, the, the community is ripe. We had Khatm al-Qur'an on the same night between these communities. Three masjids, three miles apart. One three miles away from here, one six miles away from here. We had the Khatm al-Qur'an on the same night. We had maybe two and a half thousand here. Another two, two and a half thousand over there. And I heard five thousand on the other side at IFS. Right? SubhanAllah, you're looking on just one night simultaneously. You have maybe nine to ten thousand people within a six mile radius. Right? What is that? That just tells you a glimpse of how many Muslims are out there. A glimpse. And do you think everyone showed up for Khatm al Quran? Obviously not. Obviously not. I know, I know brothers here whose own, subhanAllah, they come and tell me, please make dua for my XYZ, you know, sibling or child who's just, who just lives a thousand feet from the masjid, but he doesn't come even khatam night, please call him, etc., etc. SubhanAllah, so the maidan wasih, the maidan is huge. We simply have to put on the cap of ummati of Rasulullah Sallallahu So that's what Nabi alayhi salatu salam, after seeing all of this, after seeing Jannah and Jahannam, or veils are being removed, he felt the pain. That's why he said, Wallahi law ta'alamuna ma alam, la dahiktum kalila, wa la bakaytum kathira. I swear by Allah, if you only you knew what I knew, you would have laughed less and you would have cried much. I swear if you knew what I knew, you would have laughed less and would have cried much. Subhanallah. I mean the hadith continues on, it's amazing. So this is <clears throat> what the Quran is supposed to give us, the concern and the fikr. It will happen when the yaqeen on the verses of the Quran will be increased. Allah says, إِلَّا تَذْكِرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى Unfortunately, not everyone is going to take benefit. Who will take benefit? Those who are uh, filled with awe and reverence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the Quran says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Hidayah, guidance is for those who have taqwa. Without khashiya, Meaning, if we do not have khashiya, if we do not have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my beloved brothers and sisters, then we're not going to start thinking. Who thinks about the Qur'an? The one who believes that this is the word of Allah. So it goes back to us feeling awestruck by the Qur'an. If we feel, wow, this is the kalam of Allah. This is the spoken word of Allah. When that excitement comes into us, then we will see, we will take effect. So basically, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being told by Allah, don't waste your time after those people who don't have fear of Allah, who don't have fear of the, who don't have, who don't, yaksha, not just fear, reverence, who don't revere the Qur'an. Because if they don't revere the Qur'an, they're not going to think. And if you don't think, you don't get hidayah. You have to think. You have to think in order to get hidayah. The Qur'an says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Do they not ponder over the Qur'an? أَمْهَالَ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Or are they locks on their heart? Why don't they think? The Qur'an says, مَا لَكُمْ What's wrong with you? كَيْفَ تَحْكُمُونَ How do you make these decisions? The Qur'an says, فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Where are you going? <coughs> the Qur'an says, فَأَنَّ تُصْرَفُونَ Where are you being turned away from the deen? The Qur'an says, After listening to the Qur'an, which speech do you all want? After listening to such a powerful words of Allah, which speech are you looking for that you want to believe? Allah says, قَلِيلَ ما تتذكرون. قليلا ما تتذكرون. How little do you take heed? How little do you take heed from? So, how do we I create this awe and reverence for the Quran? Next ayah. تنزيلا ممن خلق الأرض. ذي شرف الرسالة على قدر شرف المرسل. The honor of the message is based on the honor of the one who sent it. The, the message is honorable due to the message writer. So who, whose message is this? Who's a sender? It is Allah. Okay, who is Allah? Allah Jalla Jalaluhu says, Mimman khalaq as samawat It's from the one who actually created the earth. Was samawat al-ula. And <clears throat> the, the um, uh, high heavens. Such an amazing Allah who created the heavens and the earth is the one who sent this. Meaning, if we understand the greatness of Allah, we will understand the greatness of this book. If we understand the greatness of this book, we will have the keys of success. 
There's not a single verse, not a single nukta, not a single dot, not a single letter of the Qur'an that doesn't hold within it the keys of our success. For example, take one ayah. Surah, Surah An-Nur, ayah number 55. Allah says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ Allah makes a promise. Allah makes a promise with the believers from amongst you. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ and those who do righteous deeds, لا يستخلفنهم في الأرض. Allah will make them the Khalifa. Allah will make them the vicegerent on earth. كما استخلف الذين من قبلهم the way He made the previous nations, the Khulafa and the vicegerents and the leaders of the earth. ولا يمكننا لهم دينهم. And Allah will give strength and power to the Deen الذي ارتضى لهم, which He has chosen for them, which is the Deen of Islam. وَلَا يُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنًا And he will change their current situation of fear and terror to a, condition, to a condition of peace and contentment. This is the solution. Allah is basically saying, you have iman and a'mal salihah Iman, faith and good deeds. I will give you success in this dunya. I will give you power. I will give you dominion. I will give you everything you want. وَنَا عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَمُنْثَى وَمُؤْمِنٍ Whoever does righteous deeds, be the male or female, as long as if they have iman, فَلَنُحِيَّنَّهُ حَيَاتٌ طَيِّبًا Indeed, we'll definitely give them a beautiful life, a righteous life. So the, the idea here is, understand that every verse of the Qur'an, in it lies the success of all of us. Where did this came from? This came from the one who created the heavens and the earth. الرحمن وعلى العرش استوى Who is Allah? Again, He is Allah, the All-Merciful, who has settled Himself over the throne. Now, when it comes to Arsh Istawa, you know, the, the aspect of Istiwa, or literally translated as settling on the throne, the mazhab and the methodology of interpretation of the righteous predecessors is that, tafweed, you completely leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not delve into the details of how, when, where, and things of that sort. As Imam Malik has famously mentioned, al istiwa ma'loom, wal kayf majhul. That istiwa, istiwa or settling on the throne, istiwa ma'loom. It's accepted, it's a known fact, it's mentioned in the Quran, there's no denial. Number two, al kayfu majhul. The method of how it happened, that's unknown and not for us to be known. And to ask how it happened, this is an innovation. The companions never ask these type of questions, and hence none of us should ever be asking these type of questions. It is absolutely not. Uh, in our scope to know this. It's something that is between Allah. Allah has kept it with Himself. <clears throat> so now, you leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did istiwa. Then some of these uh, salaf, or khalaf, the latter ulama, they saw that people are becoming confused with this concept. And that they are interpreting it in, in a literal sense. And Allah forbid, they started going into anthropoformism and they started giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a limbs, and they started saying uh, things that do not uh, befit Allah. So now people are getting confused. How do you do? So some of the khalaf, some of the uh, uh, latter ulama, they be, they started giving a possible, plausible interpretation, and said that this there, there is a metaphorical. This is meant in a metaphorical sense. That istiwa is very commonly used uh, for. When someone takes the reins of a presidency, someone takes the reins of a kingdom, the king has ascended to the throne. He may actually not have physically, he doesn't have a throne or he sat, sat a throne, but he's not sitting on the throne all the time. So the idea is that this type of statement is used to denote taking control of things. So istawa al-arsh from a metaphorical sense, it could also simply mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took complete control of the heavens and the earth. Okay, having, having said that, now move on and say, notice how Allah did not say, Arabu ala al-arsh istawa. Allah did not say, Allahu ala al-arsh istawa. Allah did not say, Malikul mulk ala al-arsh istawa. Instead, He said, Ar-Rahman. Such an amazing, amazing ayah here that if you want to know who's running the affairs, who's become the full controller of the entire aspect of the heavens and the earth, whatever's above, whatever's beyond, whatever's behind, whatever's in front, it is in the hands of the most merciful. So you, you got to feel happy and content that you're in the right world whose control is in the hands of the most merciful. Whose hands, who is, whose control is in the hands of the most merciful. So if that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why will He let you down? It comes in certain riwayat, it's, that Allah azza wa jal, it uh, says, the words, uh, you know, maybe, whatever they may be, but the meaning is definitely true. Ana malikul muluk. I am the king of all kings. Wa malikul muluk. And I am 
the, uh, the, uh, the owner of all kings. The hearts of the kings are in my hand. If the servants are to obey me, I will turn the attention of their kings towards them and I will fill the hearts of the kings with love and mercy for their public. And if the servants disobey me, I will turn the hearts away of the kings from the public and I'll fill, it, fill the hearts of the kings with, with anger and a desire to punish. فَلَا تُشْغِلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ بِالْمُلُوكِ Do not make yourself busy with the kings. Don't keep yourself preoccupied with the kings. وَدْعُوا لَهُمْ بِالصَّلَاحِ Pray for their righteousness. فَإِنَّ صَلَاحَهُمْ بِصَلَاحِكُمْ For indeed their righteousness depends upon your righteousness. This, mashallah, is the answer to the problems in the Muslim world and the non-Muslim world. Everyone is speaking about politics. Everyone is passionate about politics. Well, this, this tells you exactly what's going on. That the king cannot, a president and a prime minister cannot rule unless the public is in a position that would allow such a, such a, such a person to rule. So when we see corrupt people in government, we know that the public has become corrupt. And until the public doesn't come right and doesn't repent, nothing will change. So instead of focusing on cursing people, subhanAllah, let's focus on improving ourselves and making dua for the ummah and the leaders as well. Then Allah Azza wa says, لَهُمَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ To Him belongs. This is one of the most comprehensive ayats in the Qur'an that speak about the, the power and the greatness of Allah. Uh, that to Him belongs everything is in the heavens and everything that's in the earth. وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا And everything that's between them. And then it didn't stop there. وَمَا تَحْتَ الثَّرَى And whatever is below the soil. So the seven earths that are there, whose haqiqa and reality only Allah knows. Or below, you thought it's earth, but below that earth are hidden treasures. You've got all the minerals, you've got all the elements, you've got the oil. You've got so many hidden treasures below the soil. All of that is in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How knowledgeable and how alim and how powerful Allah is. in tajhar, If you choose to speak out loud, or you choose to speak softly, regardless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ya'lam, He knows. Notice Allah didn't say He hears because some things are not heard. Thoughts are not heard. Thoughts are not heard. So He didn't say He hears that which is a secret. He hears that what is in. He says He knows because there are certain many things that are not, that are not heard. They are never even verbalized. Right? So what is sir? Some say sir is between you and your friends, you and your bosom friend, you and your spouse. And akhfa is between you and yourself. Another explanation is, sir is between you and yourself, and akhfa is that which you don't even know about yourself. SubhanAllah. That's why Ali radiallahu anhu says, Allah knows, Ali ma makan wa Ali ma sayakun. Allah knows what happened, Allah knows what will happen. Wa Ali ma annahu ma lam yakun lo kana kayfa kan. And he knows what didn't happen, but if it were to happen, how it would happen. That he knows as well. You know, someone says, man, I wonder what would happen if I had a million dollars. Most likely you and I wouldn't be sitting here. Right? I wouldn't be sitting here. Right? Think about it. No, we don't know. We don't. Maybe I would be sitting here. Maybe I would somehow be doing great things. The idea is, there's, there's a million possibilities of what, what if this, what if that. Allah actually knows all of those possibilities. That if He were to give you uh, what would happen, or if, if, if the day would change, or the sun would change, uh, you know, whatever. Any change in the formulas, what would have happened? So that's all part of akhfa. We have absolutely no idea about that. But it's, 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 part, it's, it's hidden there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you speak out loud, you speak softly. Of course, the famous story, I don't have time right now to get into that, but Safwan and the incident of the two disbelievers who made a pact outside of the Kaaba and who said that we are going to go and, one of, and he said, we go kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And if you do, Umair and Safwan, right? He said, go kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they made a pledge there under the Kaaba. He said, if you, if you, all your children, I will take responsibility. If they become orphans, if you die, all your loans, I will take care of it. This is a famous story. I'm just quickly running through it. So Umair went to, um, he went to Mecca. He went to Medina. And it was right after Badr. And he went on the pretext, he went on the pretext that he's going to get, his, uh, his brother was a POW. He became a prisoner of war. And he said, I'm going to go get my brother out, ransom him out. But he took a poison sword. And the goal was to assassinate Rasulullah. Umar al-Allah on the side, saw him coming in, Umar. 
and he grabbed him, he tied him, and he grabbed him, and he, he grabbed him, brought him to Rasulullah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, Umar here has come with a sword. I don't think he's come with any good intention. And Nabi alayhi wa said, Umar, untie him, untie him. He did. He said, Umar, back away. You move, I want to speak to him. And then he looked at him and said, Say, uh, uh, well, what brought you here? He said, I came here for my brother. He says, no, tell me what else you brought. Well, go, how about you say, Assalamu alaikum properly? He says, no. I'm not going to say salam alaikum. And he, he said, Ani'im sabahan. This was the method of saying salam during the era of Jahiliyyah. He said, Say salam. He said, No, I don't want to say salam. He said, Why have you come here? I came here for my brother. No, you have not. What about that sword? He said, uh, Swords? Well, swords don't really help. We lost in Badr horribly. Didn't help us then. So then he says, Oh, okay, nice story. But what about you and your discussion with Safwan outside of the Kaaba where you made that commitment? As soon as he heard that, he said, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa na ashadu wa rasulullah. Done. How, there was, wallahi, no one, no one, no one heard. Our own wives do not know about this conversation. No one in Makkah knows I'm here. How did you hear about this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows it and Allah informed Rasulullah sallam. He took, he, took, he took the shahada and became a Muslim. Over this, Safwan's waiting every day. One day, two day, one week, two week. He's waiting for the news to spread that Muhammad is dead. He's waiting. He's asking all the caravans are coming. What's the news? And they said, there's no news. And eventually the news became that what? Umayyad has accepted Islam. So this is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows whatever's in our hearts and the secrets. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to have beautiful thoughts in our heart so that we, have never, we don't need to be ashamed of what Allah knows. Right? Allahu la ilaha illahu. There is an unworthy of worship but Allah and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the most excellent names. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase in us, us in His love and His muhabba and fill our hearts with, fill our hearts with the yaqeen in Allah, Allah's names and attributes. And inshallah wa ta'ala we will end here. Uh, Aisha is in two minutes. I, a friendly reminder to everyone to make Niyav to come here every Tuesday. Inshallah please. And uh, invite another five, ten people with you every single Tuesday. Inshallah. And additionally, um, uh, are the other drus will continue. Salawat after Isha on Thursdays. Bukhari dars after Maghrib on Friday. The team Fajr on Saturday morning. And do not forget the annual retreat which will be taking place the last weekend of May. Starting from Friday till Monday, 27th to 30th. Friday to Monday. Monday, Memorial Day weekend will be an ill workshop. So the program will actually end at 6 p.m. on Monday, inshallah. Please plan to participate to the best of your ability that weekend and invite your family and friends as well. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Shalala ilaha illa anna astaghfirullah wa natubilaik wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.